Howdy, everybody. Welcome to the beginning of a new series. As I work my way through Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx by Augustus Le Plongeon, MD. I've referenced and quoted this book countless times. I did a kind of an introductory series when I was discussing Atlantis, Lemuria, and transitioning into Central America, kind of the Mexico myth of the Mayan, the Aztec, Olmec, etc. My original plan was to kind of do an audio book, so to say, but I've decided for this introductory introductory episode, I'm going to read the preface and the introduction. And then throughout the rest of the chapters, each chapter will be an episode. And throughout that chapter, I'll go through historical records, newspapers, um, other examples um, of supporting and contradictory information. You know, obviously, it's a fantastic book. And like all books, I'm going to agree and disagree with certain things here and there. But it's really just a presentation of uh, not only the book, but my own perspective on it. So yeah, like I said, this episode will be primarily me reading the preface and the introduction. And then as we work our way through the rest of the book, I'll be, uh, you know, establishing uh, how I feel about the facts being presented and things that I see throughout my own labors and, and others that correlate or perhaps point elsewhere as far as <clears throat> the information, you know, and Facts, fiction, conjecture, it's all part of the game. And more than anything, I just want this to be uh, an enjoyable presentation um, and bring some pretty interesting historical facts and finds from the 1800s um, that not a lot of people know about, surprisingly. But yeah, without further ado, like I said, preface introduction and that's a quite a long account um as it is so for those more familiar with my presentation style bear with me but yeah um so let's jump right in queen mu and the egyptian sphinx by augustus le plongeon sacred mysteries among the mayas and the quiches a sketch of the ancient inhabitants of Peru and their civilization. Published in New York, 1900. This is his wife. Um, later on in this book, we'll discuss her her background, her opinions a little bit further. But um, to my wife, Alice de Lepojo, my constant companion during my explorations of the ruined cities of the Mayas, who, in order to obtain a glimpse of the history of their builders, has exposed herself to many dangers, suffered privations, sickness, hardship, my faithful and indefable collaborator at home. This work is affectionately and respectively dedicated. 1896. I'll have a link in the description as well if you want to uh, dive into this on your own. And you can see, um, you could spend a whole year just going through the authors and uh, books he quotes alone. Uh, it's quite a well-sourced and written book. Here are some of the plates, the pictures we'll be looking at. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Let's go single page. No, that's harder to see. That's a little better. The images are quite quite wonderful. But yeah, let's let's jump in here. Uh, let's see if we can. Does that cut off anything? Bear with me as we get this all situated and uh, the appearance as appropriate as we can get it for you guys. <clears throat> I don't want to go single page because it's all right. Preface to accept any authority as final 
and to dispense with the necessity of independent investigation, it's destructive of all progress. Manned by two cellists. What you have learned to verify by experience, otherwise learning is in vain. Indian saying, I love that. What you have learned, verify by experience, otherwise learning is vain. In this work, I offer no theory. In questions of history, theories prove nothing. They are, therefore, out of place. I leave my readers to draw their own inferences from the facts presented for their consideration. Whatever be their conclusions is no concern of mine. One thing, however, is certain. Neither their opinion nor mine will alter events that have happened in the dim past of which so little is known today. A record of many of these events has reached our times written by those who took part in them in a language still spoken by several thousands of human beings. There we may read part of man's history and follow the progress of his civilization. The study in situ of the relics of the ancient Mayas has revealed such striking analogies between their language, their religious concepts, their cosmogonic notions, and their manners and customs, their traditions, their architecture, and the language, the religious conceptions, the cosmogonic nations, notions, sorry, the manners and customs, the traditions, the architecture of the ancient civilized nations of Asia, Africa, and Europe, of which we have any knowledge, that is, has become evident to my mind at least, that such similarities are not merely effects of hazard, but the result of intimate communications that must have existed between all of them, and that distance was no greater obstacle to their intercourse than it is today to that of the inhabitants of various countries. It has been, and still is, a favorite hypothesis with certain students of ethnology that the Western continent, now known as America, received its human populations, therefore its civilization, from Asia. True, there is a split in their ranks. They are not quite certain if the immigration in America came from Tartary, across the Strait of the Bering, or from Hindustan over the waste of the Pacific Ocean. This, however, is of little consequence. There are those who pretend, like Klaprov, that the cradle of humanity is to be found on the plateau of Pamir, between the high peaks of the Himalayan ranges, or like Messrs. Renan and Bartholomew, St. Hilaire, who place it in the region of Timaeus, in the countries where the Bible says the Garden of Eden, Eden was situated, while others are equally certain man came from Lemuria, that submerged continent invented by P. L. Slater, which Heckled believes was the birthplace of the primitive ape man, which they say now lies under the waves of the Indian Ocean. The truth of the matter is that these opinions are mere conjectures, simple hypothesis, and their advocates know no more when, where man first appeared on the earth than the newborn babe knows of his surroundings or how he came. The learned wranglers of this shadowy and dim point forget that all leading geologists now agree in the opinion that America is the oldest continent on the face of the planet that the fossil remains of human beings found in various parts of it far distant from each other prove that man lived there in times immemorial, and that we have not the slightest ray of light to illumine the darkness that surrounds the origins of those primeval men. Furthermore, it is now admitted by the generality of scientists that man, far from descending from a single pair, located in a particular portion of the Earth's surface, has appeared on every part of it, where the biological conditions have been provided to his development and maintenance, and that the production of the various species with their distinct, well-marked anatomical and intellectual characteristics was due to the difference of those biological conditions and to the general forces calling forth animal life prevalent in the places where each particular species has appeared and whose distinctive marks were adapted to its peculiar environment. The Maya sages doubtless had reached similar conclusions since they called their country Mayak, that is, the land first emerged from the bosom of the deep. The country of the Shute and the Egyptians, according to Herodotus, boasted that their ancestors in the lands of the West were the oldest men on earth. 
If the opinion of Lyell, Humphrey, and a host of modern geologists regarding the priority of American's antiquity be correct, what right have we to gainsay the assertion of the Mayas and the Egyptians in claiming likewise priority for their people and their country? It is but natural to suppose that intelligence in man was developed on the oldest continent among its most ancient inhabitants, and that its combatant civilization grew apace with its development. When, at the impulse of the instinct of self-preservation, men linked themselves into clans, tribes, and nations, history was born, and with it a desire to commemorate the events of which it is composed. The art of drawing or writing was then invented. The incidents regarded as most worthy of being remembered and preserved for the knowledge of coming generations were carved on the most enduring material in their possession, stone. And so it is that we find today the cosmogonic and religious notions, the records of natural phenomenon and predominant incidents in the history of their nation and that of their rulers, sculptured on the walls of the temples and palaces of the civilized Mayas, Chaldeans, and Egyptians, as on the sacred rocks and in the hollowed caves of primitive, uncivilized man. It is to the monumental inscriptions and to the books of the Mayas that we must turn if we wish to learn about the primitive traditions of mankind. The development of civilization and the events that took place centuries before the dim mist recorded as occurrences at the beginning of our written history. Historians, when writing on the universal history of the race, have never taken into consideration that of man in America and the role that in remote ages American notions played on the world stage and the influence they exerted over the populations of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Still, as far as we can scan, the long vista of the past centuries, the Mayas seem to have had direct and intimate communications with them. This fact is indeed no new revelation, as proved by the universality of the name Maya, which seems to have been a well-known as by all civilized nations thousands of years ago as it is today that of the English. Thus we meet with it in Japan, the islands of the Pacific, Hindustan, Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, Equatorial Africa, North and South America, as well as in the countries known to us as Central America, which in those times composed the Maya Empire. The seat of the government and residence of the rulers was the peninsula of the Yucatan, where found the name Maya is synonymous with power, wisdom, and learning. The existence of the Western continent was no more a mystery to the inhabitants of this country bordering on the Mediterranean than those whose shores are bathed by the waves of the Indian Ocean. Valmiki, in his beautiful epic, The Ramayana, says that in times so remote that the sun had not yet risen above the horizon, the Mayas, great navigators, terrible warriors, learned architects, conquered the southern parts of the Indo-Chinese peninsula established themselves there. In the classic authors Greek and Latin, we find frequent mention of the great Saturnian continent, distance many thousands stadia from the pillars of Hercules toward the setting sun. Plutarch, in his Life of Solon, says that when the famed Greek legislature visited Egypt 600 years before the Christian era, Sonchus, a priest of Sias, also Sphenophis, a priest of Heliopolis, told him that 9,000 years since, the relations of the Egyptians with the inhabitants of the lands of the West had been interrupted because of the mud that had made the sea impassable after the destruction of Atlantis by the earthquakes. The same author again in his work, De Fasse and Orbe Lune, as Sila recount to his brother Lampheus, all that he had learned concerning from them a stranger he met at Carthage returning from the transatlantic countries. That the western continent was visited by Carthaginians a few years before the indicting of Plato's Atlantis, the portraits of men with long beards and Phoenician features discovered by me in 1875, sculptured on the contum, columns and ante of the castle at Chichen, bear witness. 
Herodotus Silus attributes the discovery of the Western continent to the Phoenicians and describes it as a country where the landscape is varied by very lofty mountains and the temperature is always soft and equable. Prosophius, alluding to it, says in several thousand stadia from Ogia and encloses the whole sea into which a multitude of rivers descending from the highlands discharge their waters. Theophomphus of Quio, speaking of its magnitude, says, compared with it, our world is but a small island. And Cicero, mentioning it, makes use of nearly the same words. Ominous inen terra quae colitor e vobis Parvocadam est insula. Aristotle, in his work, De Miribul Asculatio, giving an account of it, represents it as a very large and fertile country, well watered by abundant streams, and he refers to a decree enacted by the Senate of Carthage towards the year 509 BC, intended to stem the current of immigration that had set toward the western lands, as they feared it might prove detrimental to the prosperity of their city. The belief in the former existence of extensive lands in the middle of the Atlantic and their submergence in consequence of seismic convulsions existed among scientists even as far down as the 5th century of the Christian era. Proclus, one of the great scholars of antiquity, who during the 35 years was at the head of the Neoplatonic school of Athens and was learned in all the sciences known in his day, in his commentaries on Plato's Timaeus, says, The famous Atlantis exists no longer, but we can hardly doubt that it did once. For Marcellus, who wrote a history of Ethiopian affairs, says that such and so great an island once existed, that it is evidenced by those who composed histories relative to the external sea. For they relate, in this time, there were seven islands in the Atlantic Sea, sacred, to Proserpine, and besides these, three of immense magnitude, sacred to Plato, Jupiter, and Neptune, Pluto, I'm sorry. And besides this, the inhabitants of the last island, Poseidonus, preserved the memory of the prodigious magnitude of the Atlantic island, as related by their ancestors, and of its governing for many periods, all the islands of the Atlantic Sea. From this isle, one may pass to other large islands beyond which are not far from the firm land near which is the true sea. It is well to notice that like all the Maya authors who have described the awful cataclysms that caused the submergence of the land of Mu, Proclus mentions the existence of ten countries or islands as Plato did, but this be a mere coincidence, or was it actual geographical knowledge on the part of these writers? Inquiries are often made as to the causes that led to the interruption of communications between the inhabitants of the western continent and the dwellers on the coast of the Mediterranean after they had been renewed by the Carthaginians. It is evident that the mud spoken of by the Egyptian priests had settled in the course of centuries and that the seaweeds mentioned by Emilco had ceased to be a barrier sufficient to impede the passage since Carthaginians reached the shores of the Yucatan at least 500 years before the Christian era. These causes may be found in the destruction of Carthage, of its commerce and its ships by the Romans under Pluvis Scipio. The Romans never were navigators. After the fall of Carthage, public attention being directed to their conquests in northern Africa, in western Asia, and in Greece, to their wars with the Teutons and the Cimbri, to their own civil dissensions, and to many other political events that preceded the decadence and disintegration of the Roman Empire. The maritime expeditions of the Phoenicians and of the Carthaginians, their discoveries of distance and transatlantic countries became well nigh forgotten. On the other hand, those hardy navigators kept their discoveries as secret as possible. With the advent and ascendancy of the Christian church, the remembrance of the existence of such lands that still lingered among students, as that of the Egyptian and the Greek civilizations, was utterly obliterated from the mind of the people. If we are to believe Tertullian and other ecclesiastical writers, the Christians, during the first centuries of the Christian era, held in abhorrence all arts, science, which, like literature, 
they attributed to the muses and therefore regarded as artifices of the devil. They consequently destroyed all vestiges as well as all means of culture. They closed the academies of Athens, the schools of Alexandria, burned the libraries of the Serpion and other temples of learning, which contained the works of the philosophers and the records of the researches in all branches of human knowledge. They depopulated the countries to bathe by the waters of the Mediterranean, plunged the populations of Western Europe into ignorance, superstition, fanaticism, threw over them as an intellectual mortuary pal, the black wave of barbarism that during the Middle Ages came nigh wiping out all traces of civilization, which was saved from total wreck by the followers of Muhammad, whose great mental and scientific attainments illumined that night of intellectual darkness as a brilliant meteor, to soon extinguished by those miners, minions of the church and the members of the Holy Inquisition established by Pope Lucius III. The Inquisitors, imitating their worthy predecessors, the metropolitans of Constantinople, the bishops of Alexandria, closed the academies and public schools of Cordoba, where Pope Celester II and several other high dignitaries of the church had been admitted as pupils and acquired, under the tuition of Moorish philosophers, knowledge of medicine, geography, rhetoric, chemistry, physics, mathematics, astronomy, and the other sciences contained in the thousands of precious volumes that formed the superb libraries, which the inquisitors wantonly destroyed, alleging St. Paul's example. Abundant proofs of the intimate communications of the ancient Mayas with the civilized nations of Asia, Africa, and Europe are to be found among the remains of their ruined cities. Their peculiar architecture, embodying their cosmogonic and religious notions, is easily recognized in the ancient architecture monuments of India, Chaldea, Egypt, Greece, in the Great Pyramid of Giza, in the famed Parthenon of Athens. Although architecture is an unerring standard of the degree of civilization reached by a people, and constitutes, therefore, an important factor in historical research. Although it is a, cor a correct a test of race as is language, and more easily applied and understood, not being subject to changes, I have refrained from availing myself of it in order not to increase the limits of the present work. I reserve the teachings that may be gathered from the study of the Mayan monuments for a future occasion, restricting my observations now principally to the memorial hall at Chichen, dedicated to the manes of Prince Ko by his sister's wife, Queen Mu, and to the mausoleum erected by her order to contain his effigy and his cremated remains. In the first, she caused to be painted on the walls of the funeral chamber the principal events of his and her life, just as the Egyptian kings had the events of their own lives painted on the walls of their tombs. Language is admitted to be the most accurate guide in tracing the family relation of various peoples, even when inhabiting countries separated by vast extents of land or water. In the present instance, Maya, still spoken by thousands of human beings, and in which the inscriptions sculptured on the walls of the temples and palaces in the ruined cities of Yucatan are written, we are also the few books of the ancient Maya sages that have come to our hands, will be the thread of Erendim that will guide us in following the tracks of the colonists from Mayak in their peregrinations. In every locality where their name is found, there also we meet with their language, their religious and cosmogonic notions, their traditions, customs, architecture, and a host of other indications of their presence and permanency and of the influence they have exerted on the civilization of the aboriginal inhabitants. My readers will judge for themselves of the correctness of this assertion. The reading of the Maya inscriptions and books, among other very interesting subjects, reveal the origin of many narratives that have come down to us as traditions in the sacred books of various notions, and which are regarded by many as inexplicable myths. 
For instance, we find in them the history of certain personages who, after their death, became the gods most universally revered by the Egyptians, Isis and Osiris, whose earthly history, related by Wilkinson and other writers who regarded it as a myth, corresponds exactly to that of Queen Mu and her brother-husband, Prince Ko, whose charred heart was found by me preserved in a stone urn in his mausoleum at Chichen. Osiris, we are told, was killed by his brother through jealousy and because his murderer wished to seize the reins of the government. He made war against the widow, his own sister, whom he came to hate bitterly after having been madly in love with her. In these same books, we learn the true meaning of the tree of knowledge in the middle of the garden, of the temptation of the woman by the serpent offering her fruit. This offering of fruit as a declaration of love which was a common occurrence in the everyday life of the Mayans, Egyptians, and Greeks, loses all the seemingly incongruity presents in the narrative of Genesis for lack of a word of explanation. But this shows how very simple facts have been and still are made use of by crafty men, such as the high priest Hilkiah, to devise religious speculation and impose on the good faith of ignorant, credulous, and superstitious masses. It is on this story of the courting of Queen Mu by Prince Ak, the murderer of her husband, proposedly disfigured by the shimming Jewish priest Hilkia, who made the woman appear to have yielded to her temper, perhaps out of spite against the prophetess Hulda. She, having refused to countenance his fraud and to become his accomplice in it, that rests the whole fabric of the Christian religion, which, since its advent in the world, has been the cause of so much bloodshed, bloodshed and so many atrocity crimes, atrocious crimes. In these Maya writings, we also meet with the solution that much mooted question among modern scientists, the existence, destruction, and submergence of a large island in the Atlantic Ocean, as related by Plato in his Timaeus and Critias, in consequence of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, of this dreadful cataclysm in which perished 64 millions of human beings, four different authors have left descriptions in the Mayan language. Two of these narratives are illustrated, that contained in the Troano MS, the other in the Codex Cortesinus. The third has been engraved on stone in relief and placed for safekeeping in a room in a building at Chichen where it exists today, sheltered from the action of the elements and preserved for the knowledge of the coming generations. The fourth was written thousands of miles from Mayak in Athens, the brilliant Grecian capital in the form of an epic poem in the Mayan language. Each line of said poem formed by a composed word is the name of one of the letters of the Greek alphabet, rearranged as we have it 403 years before the Christian era under the Archbishop Eleutices. Fleeing from the wrath of her brother, Ak, Queen Mu, directed her course towards the rising sun in the hope of finding shelter in some of the remnants of the land of Mu, as the Azores, for instance. Failing to fall in with such a place of refuge as she was seeking, she continued her journey eastward and at last reached the Maya colonies that for many years had been established on the banks of the Nile. The settlers received her with open arms, called her the little sister, Isin, Isis, and proclaimed her their queen. Before leaving her mother country in the West, she had caused to be erected not only a memorial hall to the memory of her brother husband, but also a superb mausoleum in which were placed his remains and a statue representing him. On the top of the monument was his totem, a dying leopard with a human head, a veritable sphinx. Once established in the land of her adoption, did she order the erection of another of his totems, again a leopard with human head, to preserve his memory among her followers? The names inscribed on the base of the Egyptian sphinx seem to suggest this conjecture, 
Though the ages, this Egyptian Sphinx has been the enigma of history, has its solution at last been given by the ancient Maya archives. In the appendix are presented, for the first time in modern ages, the cosmogonic notions of the ancient Mayas rediscovered by me. They will be found identical with those of the other civilized nations of antiquity. In them are embodied many of the secret doctrines communicated in their initiations to the adepts in India, Chaldea, Egypt, Samothracia, the origin of worship of the cross, of that of the tree, and the serpent introduced in India by the Nagas, who raised such a magnificent temple in Cambodia in the city of Angkor Thom to their god, the seven-headed serpent, the Akchapat of the Mayas, and afterward carried in worship to Akkad and to a Babylon. In these cosmogonic notions, we find the reason why the number 10 was held most sacred by all civilized nations of antiquity, and why the Mayas, who, in their scheme of numeration, adopted the decimal system, did not reckon by tens but by fives and twenties, and why they used the twenty millionth part of half the meridian as standard of lineal measures. In the following pages, I simply offer to my readers the relation of certain facts I have learned from the sculptures, the monumental inscriptions carved on the walls of the ruined palaces of the Mayas, the record of which is likewise contained in such of their books as have reached us. I venture only such explanations as will make clear their identity with the conceptions of the same subjects of the wise men of India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Greece. I do not ask my readers to accept my own conclusions, but to follow the sound advice contained in the Indian saying quoted at the beginning of this preface. Verify by experience what you have learned. Then, and only then, form your own opinion. When formed, hold fast to it, although it may be contrary to your pre preconceived ideas. In order to help in the verification of the facts herein presented, I have illustrated this book with photographs taken in situ, drawings, and plans according to actual careful surveys made by me of the monuments. The accuracy of said drawings and plans can be easily proved on the photographs themselves. I have besides given many references whose correctness is not difficult to ascertain. This is not a book of romance or imagination, but a work, one of a series intended to give ancient America its proper place in the universal history of the world. I have been accused of promulgating notions on ancient America contrary to the opinion of men regarded as authorities on American archaeology, and so it is indeed. Mine is not the fault, however, although it may be my misfortune, since it has surely entailed upon me their enmity and in consequences. But who are those pretended authorities? Certainly not the doctors and professors at the head of universities and colleges in the United States, for not only do they know absolutely nothing of ancient American civilization, but, judging from letters in my possession, the majority of them refuse to learn anything concerning it. It may be inquired on what ground can those who have published books on the subject in Europe or in the United States establish their claim to be regarded as authorities? What do they know of the ancient Mayas, of their customs and manners, of their scientific or artistic attainments? Do they understand the Mayan language? Can they interpret one single sentence of the book in which the learning of the Mayan sages their cosmogonic, geographic, religious, and scientific attainments are recorded? From what source have they derived their pretended knowledge? Not from the writings of the Spanish chroniclers, surely. These only wrote of the natives as they found them at the time of the long after the conquest of America by their countrymen, whose fanatical priests destroyed by fire the only sources of information, the books and ancient records of the Maya philosophers and historians. Father Lopez de Calado, in his History de Yucatan, frankly admits his time raised 
his time, no information could be obtained concerning the ancient history of the Mayas. He says, of the peoples who first settled in the, this kingdom of Yucatan, or their ancient history, I have been unable to obtain any other data than those which follow. The Spanish chroniclers do not give one reliable word about the manners and customs of the builders of the grand antique edifices that were objects of admiration to them as they are to the modern travelers. The only answer the natives to the inquiries of the Spaniards as to who the builders were veritably was, we do not know. For fear of wounding the pride of the pseudo-authorities, shall the truth learn from the works of the Mayan sages and the inscriptions carved on the walls of their deserted temples and palaces be withheld from the world? Must the errors they propagate be allowed to stand? And the progenitors not be called upon to prove the truth of their statements? The so-called learned men of our days are the first to oppose new ideas and the bearers of these. This opposition will continue to exist until the arrogance and self conceited of superficial learning that still ho hover within the walls of colleges and universities have completely vanished. Until the generality of intelligent men taking the trouble to think for themselves cease to accept as implicit truth the ips disic of any quadum who, pretending to know all about a certain subject, pronounces magisterially upon it until intelligent men no longer follow blindly such self-appointed teachers, always keeping in mind that to accept any authority as final and to dispense with the necessity of independent investigation is destructive of all progress. For as Dr. Pele says, there is a principle which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. This principle is contempt prior to examination. The question is often asked, of what practical utility can the knowledge that America was possibly the cradle of man's civilization be to mankind? To some, of but little use truly, but many there are who would be glad to know the origin of man's primitive traditions recorded in sacred books in the shape of myths or legends, and what were the incidents that served as basis on which has been raised the fabric of the various religious religions that have existed and do exist among men, have been and are still the cause of so many wars, dissensions, and persecutions. This knowledge would also serve to disclose the source whence emanated all the superstitions that have been and are so many obstacles in the way of man's physical, intellectual, and moral progress, and to free his mind from all such trammels and make of him what he claims to be, the most perfect work of creation on earth, also to make known the fact that Mayak, not India, is the true mother of nations. Then perhaps will be awakened in the mind of those in whose power it is to do it a desire to save and, pers and preserve what remains of the mural inscriptions carved on the walls of the ruined palaces and temples of the Mayas that are being torn to pieces by individuals commissioned by certain institutions in the United States and other places to obtain curious to adorn their museums, curios, regardless of the fact that they are destroying the remaining pages of ancient American history with the reckless hand of ignorance, thus making themselves guilty of the crime of lese history as well as iconoclasm. Perhaps also will be will be felt the necessity of recovering the libraries of the Maya sages, hidden about the beginnings of the Christian era to save them from destruction at the hands of the devastating hordes that invaded their country in those times, and to learn from their contents the wisdom of those ancient philosophers, of which that preserved in the books of the Brahmins is but the reflection. That wisdom was no doubt brought to India, and from there carried to Babylon and Egypt in very remote ages by those Maya adepts, Nikal, the exalted, who, starting from the land of their birth as missionaries of religion and civilization, went to Burma 
where they became known as Nagas, established themselves in the Deccan, whence they carried their civilizing work all over the earth. At the request of friends, and to show that the reading of my inscriptions and books is no longer an unsolved enigma, and to those who give themselves as authorities on ancient Maya paleography, are no longer justified in guessing at or in forming theories as to the meaning of the Maya symbols or the contents of said writings. I have translated verbatim the legend accompanying the image in stucco of a human sacrifice that adorned the frise of the celebrated temple of Kabul at Izamal. This legend I have selected because it is written with the the hieratic hieratic Mayan characters that are likewise Egyptian. Anyone who can read hieratic Egyptian inscriptions will have no difficulties in translating said legend by the aid of a Maya dictionary and thus finding irrefutable evidence. One, that the Mayas and Egyptians must have learned the art of writing from the same masters. Who were these? Two, that some of the ruined monuments of Yucatan are very ancient, much anterior to the Christian era, notwithstanding the opinion to the contrary of the self-styled authorities on Maya civilization. Three, that nothing now stands in the way of acquiring a perfect knowledge of the manners and customs of the scientific attainments, religious and cosmogonic conceptions of the history of the builders of the ruined temples and palaces of the Mayas. May this work receive the same acceptance from students of American archaeology and universal history as was vouchsafed to sacred mysteries among the Mayas and the Quiches. It is written for the same purpose and in the same spirit. Augustus Le Pogeon, New York, January. 1896. Whew. Yeah. Um, I realized that, uh, you know, I'm going to make a lot of pronunciation. I'm going to pronounce a lot of things wrong. And, you know, that's just going to happen. So I hope you can uh, forgive me for that. And, um, you know, kind of just uh, give me grace on my stumbles. And, uh, you know, this is a lot of these words are obviously not my my uh, native language and are quite a mouthful. So, but I planned on doing the preface and introduction, but we're already over 40 minutes in. So this will be episode one. I really look forward to your comments. And like I said, I'm going to get through the introduction. And then part of the introduction will be me presenting some of uh, my other material, establishing more of, of uh, my opinions. There's a lot in this preface that I could have jumped into and made this, you know, an hour and a half long and inserted a bunch of things. We're going to get into the book. We're going to talk about the Greek language, how the Greek alphabet is built around the the um, the myth of the Mayans and their creation story. And uh, there's just so much to cover. But I'm going to leave this one at just the preface as a good introduction. And with a lot of these chapters, they're just going to be able, you're going to be able to just listen along. You, you aren't going to have to watch or see me present too many images. There will be some where I do so. But for the most part, you'll be able to kind of audiobook style listen to this. You know, that may not be for everybody. But again, I, I, I enjoy reading this book aloud and I've read it several times. And it's time to put it into video form for those of you who have, it just, connects so many bridges between so much of my research and opinions that it has to be done. I have so much stacked up behind me and I'm just like, always feel like I'm falling behind when it comes to presenting information, but thus is life. I could never present it all. It would take a million years to do so. So I'm just trying to choose things wisely and base them upon, uh, you know, timing and what feels right to me. So ultimately I do hope you enjoy, um, the preface. There's so much, uh, there's so much juice and meat in this preface. The introduction gets even crazier and the chapters are incredible. So as always, 
Thanks for sticking with me and following me through the stumbles. I appreciate you all very much. I look forward to reading your comments and hopefully you guys are excited about listening to this and the coming episodes as I am in presenting them. Love you guys very much. Have a wonderful day. Bye guys.